where did you grow up and what was your experience like uh, going to college in the States? So I grew up in Houston, Texas, where I presently am right now. Um, I've been in Houston most of my life until I went to UT Arlington for college when I was around 17. And so from there, I went to UTA, um, the University of Texas at Arlington, kind of near the Dallas Fort Worth area. Um, and my experience as like a collegiate student at that age is very different from like me as a college student now. But growing up in the States, I've always been here. But then when you kind of go overseas, you have like a completely different perspective than you had prior to leaving. So I think most of it has been like more interactive in the States and more hands on. And then in England, where I am presently, things are more self-taught and it's a lot more reading. So I think both learning styles are like the pedagogy is like a little different. However, um, I miss being in the U.S. and I miss the way that school is, if that makes sense, like the way that school works. Yeah, I mean, speaking of school, like, so, so it's, so you're saying it's different. So what was it like yeah. going to college in the U.K. and what inspired your move? So going to college in the U.K. was honestly, at first, I thought going to be like the worst time of my life and let me explain. <laughs> okay, so firstly, you better know how to ride the subway because in the UK and London, they have the hugest or the largest transportation kind of place in all of the UK. So I didn't know what was going on. That's number one, that's the truth. Um, and that's a part of the education aspect outside of the classroom because I needed to learn how to ride the two. And in Houston, we don't have like subways. So you either walk, you ride the bus, or you have a car in Houston. Um, but once you get past the transportation aspect, you kind of get into the classroom setting. So in a classroom, the UK is different. The first thing you're gonna notice is obviously the accent. So everybody has the cute British accent and I'm from Texas. So that's number one, where I have a country. I don't know what I have now. I, I, you can tell me what I have now, but I don't know anymore. But I was told that it's changing a little bit, just a little. But people view you as you are and you have like this, um, this deep self-realization the moment you step in the classroom about who you are, where you come from. So that's number one, and it's like gonna be undeniable. Number two is everything you thought you knew will be challenged um, in the UK. And it's not in a bad way, but for example, if you thought um, I did math this way, well in the UK they call it like maths with an S, like M-A-T-H-S, they don't say we're gonna take math, they say maths. And I was like, wow. that was number one. Yeah, exactly. That's number one. But then when you get into like equation things, like I'm obviously an English major. So like my kind of trajectory curriculum is different from math. But knowing like some of my colleagues who are in like biochemistry and like all these things, hearing what they have to do as UK citizens or like maybe um, people who kind of came as like international students into the UK is completely different um, as far as the curriculum goes. And um it's challenging, but once you grasp it, it's gonna take you a long time to grasp. So for me, I thought, oh, I was number one in my class for at one point in my life in high school, okay? Not the whole time. But I was like number one at one point and I thought, okay, I got this. But then you kind of realize you have to get like acclimated to the different culture. You have to get used to like the different curriculum you have to literally fit into like the boxes even though you might be different or like and that's fine but you have to do it to survive so just to let you know i think i'm getting like a cultural aspect of it more so rather than like grades because everybody thinks like school is just like grades like okay i'm gonna get an a you know i'm smart but really school is like how can you um how can you cope in this new environment so yeah, like culture, uh, and yes. ways, of, ways of living and being. So, I mean, yeah. So, wait, you so you recently graduated, right? Yes. Yeah, so I graduated from King's College London. I was at Oxford briefly, 
um, Oxford University doing two years and like my PhD, but I recently graduated from King's College London, which both are Russell groups. So it's kind of like an Ivy League of the UK. To be honest, this is the Ivy League of the whole world. I don't, don't get me started on what I think is Ivy League. Like my whole perception has changed. And I know on the outside looking in, it is exciting um, and it's fascinating, but my biggest thing that I think I learned while my pursuit towards graduation is not just like medical humanities, which we'll talk about, I'm sure in a minute, but I learned like more so um, people are really smart. Like they are smart in a way that like they put together like sentences and like syntax. They're smart in a way like they communicate one another. They're smart in a way, like the way they walk around and navigate and like have spatial kind of consciousness. Like that is smart. And I learned, well, I'm smart in a weird way. And it's not just about book smart all the time. That's what Oxford taught me. But King's College in London, that school in London, which is a university in London, that school taught me more like, well, I have an opinion, which we'll talk about, I'm sure, about like my TED talk and everything. <laughs> yeah, well, first of all, uh, I definitely want to say congratulations on graduating. And um, uh, I wanted to ask, like, where did your interest in communication and humanities come from? So ever since, um, I think ever since I was younger, I've had um, a challenge. And my challenge was, like, understanding self-control. And I'll explain how that connects to communication. So I was on a field trip. This is how it really started. And the field trip was like to a newscaster, like a kind of mock newscaster. Um, and I wanted to be the newscaster. So the direct instruction that I got, they literally said, do not run up towards the newscaster green screen. They said, do not run. I ran anyway. And when I ran, I fell right on my face. And my knee was like bleeding, 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 bleeding. So someone asked me, they said, okay, did you run? And at the time I was like, no, I didn't run. Natasha pushed me or something like that. But then obviously I had integrity, which is another huge thing about my journey. But so I said, well, Natasha didn't push me. I ran because I wanted to speak, you know, I wanted to be seen. And I had like the privilege to like be on the news. When I was younger, I had the privilege to like be a judge and like a mock trial. I had the privilege to be like the mayor of like an exchange city. But it all came from like really wanting to speak and feeling like I had something to say, but then needing to know like the proper context and having the language to say things. So then that's when I went into communication, technical communication to learn, is there a way to kind of communicate things in a simple, effective way, but also passionate. So not only do I do like technical or scientific communication, but I also do like poetry and everything like that. Oh, wait, you might have to pause. Wait, just because people might come in. But, okay, he's, he's like, <laughs> but anyway, do you, do you want me to repeat that aspect, what I just said, or no? Uh, no, I, I definitely got it and heard it. Um, but okay. it no, no, no. I just wanted to make sure because um, when he came in, somebody up there who you cannot see. No worries. But he left. <laughs> so, yeah. Cool. So, so you also worked in education for some time. Um, I do. So, what was your titles and what colleges um, or universities did you work at? So, if we start from 2021, or 2022 and then kind of go um, backwards. So I started, or I guess currently I was at Oxford University and I worked at, as a Black Academic Future Scholarship Consultant, Scholarship Program Consultant. And in that role, it was so fun. Like, as I was also a student. So being a student in the role as a kind of worker and supporter, you kind of, have the ability to see what the black scholars might need and they will communicate with you and then they'll become your friends. So at the time, it wasn't about friendship. For me as a student, it was about like serving them as well. And I think from in those roles, you have to be like professional, but you also have to understand like the agenda of like the funding that you're provided, the agenda of like the programming that you're required to create um, in any place. 
But I think for me, the most critical thing is community. And so that's what I brought to Oxford. And then the next role I had was, I think, community facilitator at King's College London. So King's College London was similar um, as far as like me kind of pulling and resourcing the tools that I had with communication to make people talk. So in London, if you know, people don't talk on like the tube, for example, and the tube is like the subway. I don't know if you know this, but for example, there's a kind of silent, I had to learn it the hard way and I'll explain. On the tube, there's a silent communication that you don't communicate. So if you see somebody and they look at you, you don't make eye contact, you don't smile, you're literally supposed to be like the whole time on the train. Now, when I first got on the train, I looked at somebody, you know, that, that was my first time in London, so I was in 2019. So I looked at somebody and I smiled and they looked at me like, and I was like, okay, so I thought the lady yeah. was rude. Yeah, but it's a certain decorum. But kind of knowing the cultural decorum in London, trying to break that, break through that decorum academically within King's College London was difficult because some students might may have come from London, but some students have come from like Paris, Amsterdam, um, just different places, the Netherlands, and they're all different. So number one, like in that role as a community facilitator, which is basically like a person who creates community constructively through like programming similar to Oxford, but it's more like directly impacting the students and you have to make them talk. So that was my job, making them talk, making them comfortable, being a welfare lead. Um, and I think I kind of um, maybe should highlight in Oxford, I also was like the junior dean for a little bit. So that role is more like disciplinarian where yes, you want to make people talk, but also you have to like seriously understand like the rules and regulations of the institution you're at so that you can enforce them. But respectfully though, so all of my roles kind of like intersected, um, being a junior dean, being um, a community facilitator, being a program coordinator. But I think my favorite role kind of going down, cause I've had so many roles and all of them centered at the community. My favorite one would be like something um, where I worked in Houston back in the hometown when I was like 19. And it was at a nonprofit called Stair Jobs for Progress. Um, and it's a nonprofit that helps like underage youth at risk youth. Um, it helps people come from the prison system, kind of get a job and get resituated. And that was my favorite job because the communication aspect really went into play because you can't you can communicate all day, but it's like the way that you reach people and the impact that matters. So at SARE um, in Houston, in that road, that's kind of where I got like my foundation and my strength from. So communicating to like um, prisoners, like literal prisoners or people who maybe got out and wanted to, you know, kind of re-socialize. That helped me develop my skills for London because it taught me to treat everybody equally, but also know how to communicate with everybody at any time. And that role is critical in airports, I don't know why people have come to me in London at airports as if I work there. They're like, hey ma'am, can you help such and such create a ticket? We don't know what to do. And I'm like, this is the airport staff. This happened to me um, like recently. And then I helped the guy, you know, he spoke another language. I helped him in everything because I knew how to communicate. And then they gave me a shout out on like the, you know, loudspeaker when you get on the plane to London. They're like, oh, Esther Kentish. I'm like, it's not that serious. But to them, so then it was this series because you have like conflict, um, you have d people who've been through difficult things, you have difficult backgrounds, but the goal in communication is genuinely to treat everybody equally, but also relate to them in a way they want to be related to. And then you can kind of worry about cultural norms and standards later in like your rear view, but it's all about like focusing on the conversation at hand. So all of my roles, always end up in a helping role. I don't know why. I'm probably going to be a professor the next couple of years because I just, I don't know, I love helping people. Um, That's so awesome. Like, I mean, you're doing incredible work, um, which is definitely why yeah. I wanted to, you know, um, share this platform for you to like get this story out because uh, I believe that, you know, the world needs more people like you. And, yeah. Um, 
Um, it's definitely uh, beneficial, especially to our community and culture. Um, yeah, so, it is. So, uh, so you were also a TEDx speaker. Um, yes. So how did that happen, and what was the oh. <laughs> and what was your experience? Oh. So being a TEDx speaker, now this this will take the conversation. I mean, the conversation is going good, but a part of me, I'm just a I'm a poet at heart more than like an academic. So when things don't sit right with me, my first response is poetry and writing, and it has always been that way since I was. I think I started writing at age eight. So because I was in a classroom, for example, and at the time. Um, I understand what the teacher was kind of getting to. He was referencing like um some kind of quote from like Charles Darwin, who's a scientist or what very well known. But it basically he still mentioned the word like Negro, like it, just casually, like while I'm just sitting here in the front row, and he's like, Yeah, the Negro is um lower than like the ape or in the white man is the closest to God. So when my ears process that Right. So my year is perfect. I'm like, I gave him 30 seconds though to clear it up. That's how I am. So I'm like, let me just give him a few seconds to clarify his position or like, why is he mentioning this and how is it relevant? This is just how my brain works. But he didn't. So then my response naturally was to get up and leave the classroom because I cannot physically sit inside and like allow this to infiltrate my spirit. That's just how I, it just happened automatically. But when I left the classroom, I wrote a long poem about how I was feeling. And I wrote it like in the restroom kind of area um, alongside. And it was very tough to go through as like the only black scholar at the time in the English program at King's College London um, at that level, that graduate level in that program. So for me, um, hearing the word Negro, it kind of coming from somebody who's white American though. So he went to like Cornell University. So you know that you shouldn't be saying Negro in the UK just because we left doesn't mean that we can use that language in that context. So most people would say, oh, maybe he knew better. For me, I didn't, um, it had an impact on me that was so like sociocultural and also personal that it affected me. They kind of led me to write poetry about it. So when I did, somebody found out about it at King's College London and then they were like, you should sign up for our TED Talk. You need to do a TED Talk on this. And then I went and I auditioned for the TED Talk and then the whole group, um, I guess they voted for me to, you know, go on and take on this talk, thankfully. But they were able to kind of give me the platform to do so at King's College London. And that is how I became um, an international TEDx speaker because of those students there. And they were like, well, we feel you need to tell somebody about this. We think that it's an idea worth sharing, which is like the whole idea of TED Talk, to have an idea worth sharing. So though it was tough, it still, some fruit still came out of it, if that makes sense. Absolutely. I mean, that's incredible that First of all, that uh, you went through something that was emotionally uh, deteriorating, for lack of better words, and channeled that and was able to go to something like art, music, uh, music, right. <laughs> poetry. <laughs> I mean, music, no, you're right. Music too. <laughs> <laughs> um, and express yourself in that way. And so it was kind of like therapeutic. Um, for yes, you. it was. It was it was fun to write. It was tough and emotional to write though, um, because the way that the TED Talk is constructed, and I don't know um, if everybody knows this, but this is like the end and out of having the TED Talk is you write it as a speech first, you memorize it, and then you you recite it or kind of it's kind of performative in that way but the words are always yours. So you it's a lot of like editing that kind of goes into it. But for me, it wasn't really the editing that kind of edited out my feelings or anything like that. Because my poetry, the original poem that I wrote was kind of knitted into my TED talk, even though it was more like a monologue or like a, not really, a, it was a dialogue between me and myself the entire time. If you watch, if you go back and like watch it, but it, though it was sad, I was still, 
I felt it was a, um, a responsibility to share how I feel on that topic. And most of the time when I'm passionate about something that is extremely serious to me, I will share how I feel about it. But after serious thought, then and only then do I share. Because every opinion I have, I don't say anything. But if it's something that impacts society, literally, or culture, then I have to say something. So yeah. That's so awesome. Um, Thank you. <laughs> what, what, so when you do things like this and you continue to like uh, succeed in your goals, like what motivates you to keep going uh, towards your, your new goals? And um, like, do oh, you have yeah. a routine or special things that you tune into? Like, yes, <laughs> yes. Like, I'm happy you asked that. Um, for me, I think having a routine. Well, do you want me to tell you the truth, or do you want me to tell you a lie? <laughs> Whatever you want to share. I want to tell you the truth because usually I do tell the truth. But the truth is. I didn't have a routine at first and I just used to do anything as far as like never sleeping like never sleeping till like 4am in undergrad but going to England it taught me a routine it taught me to be on time it taught me to eat breakfast it taught me to have self care it taught me to advocate but prior to that I was always sharp and I always kind of did little things because being gifted and talented like as a child you're going to be like sporadic and do different things it depends on the type of child you were so I was one of those kids that kind of I didn't have a routine I just would like read books and like do things but it's still a routine in a way it's just not a linear routine it's more circular like you know so you kind of pick and choose things but it still kind of makes up a routine so to be fair, I did have a routine, but it was not linear. But now my routine is more linear versus when I was younger, it was more circular. So for example, the things that I do now is like, I must have peppermint tea when I wake up. And that's simple and it's so frivolous. And it might be like, is this important? It is important because for me, peppermint tea and like, or aromatherapy, it kind of invigorates like my senses and it makes me more creative and I have synesthesia. So synesthesia is like a person who like, you can taste like smell or you can like see music sounds. I'm that I'm that person like with wow. words and poetry. Yeah, I didn't even know. I knew a little cause somebody gave me a book called The Mango Shaped Space by Wendy Mass when I was um, 10. And that book is about a little girl who literally has synesthesia. It's not something that can be, synesthesia isn't something that can be taught. It's something you're born with, like genetically. So then when I got tested and tried, cause they would like try you. Like, you know, what numbers, if you say every number has a color, they was okay, well, what color is this? And it has to be right every single time you do it. Wow. You see what I mean? So I didn't know that. So at first I thought, well, maybe, Maybe I'm crazy, or maybe I'm dealing with something. Maybe I'm, you know, not having good sleep hygiene. But then, when you get older and you realize, okay, these are like the different things in play, then you can kind of address yourself and kind of dedicate time to that routine more. So now, like my day to day is like peppermint tea, like the Bible app, because like obviously I'm I'm a Christian, and then I also have like reading a book or an excerpt from a book. I might have a phone call. Like those phone calls are critical for me to like friends and mentors and my therapist. And it's a critical part of my mental health hygiene just to make sure nothing is going off. So that's my routine like right now. And it's a daily thing that I, um, I do. But also I think I do a lot of envisioning of like my next steps or like things I would like to do. I go back into my past sometimes and I journal and I have every journal I ever wrote since like 2009. Wow. So yeah, it's a way, like that's something I, I am, you know, thankful, thankful, thankful for. But the last thing I think I do and I wish I did more is have gratitude and like really go back. So I recently made a trip to the two aunts I referenced in my TED talk, I referenced them kind of brazen, right? Like they're 82 years old or in their 80s now. So I recently went back and told them, thank you. That's a part of my routine. And also being genuine and 
adding apology if you need that's a part of my routine so it's my routine is based on character and integrity and values rather than like um always like action if that makes sense so yeah yeah, yeah that's um that's incredible um uh, thank you, you know, I think I heard something about synesthesia, uh, synesthesia right? Oh, uh, synesthesia, yeah. I think I heard um, Pharrell Williams um, mention that. He has it. Um, yeah, I think he had like an album called Seeing Sounds. Um, yeah, wow. That, that was like the first and probably only time I heard somebody reference it. So um, that's yeah. super interesting and incredible. Um, so where can people find more information about you if they wanted to contact you for your speaking or entrepreneurship work um so for like speaking and entrepreneur entrepreneurship work because i do have a publishing company like a christian publishing company and i love helping people literally like one of my friends if he sees this interview he will laugh if he sees this podcast but he's an international rugby player so i interviewed him a long time ago and i like helped him with writing and different things so if anybody needs help with writing they can contact me directly at kentish publishing at gmail.com just like my last name and then publishing at gmail.com but if they need more like guidance like academically spiritually or personally it's easiest to contact me on like linkedin which is my name esther kentish facebook esther kentish instagram esther r kentish so it's just so many ways and I'm always like available to have like a conversation and I think that availability is also a critical part of my routine believe it or not like to just chat with different people so I have friends in like Africa who I chat with on a daily basis and I'm building like relationships with them in the Philippines the UK and I think it's not about the placement of them. It's more about like, you you learn more about culture and you learn more about the needs of others when you are able to connect with them and figure out what they're doing. So I'm open to chat with absolutely anybody as, lo- as long as it's reasonable, then I can be contacted that way. Yeah, that's so awesome. Um, thanks again, Esther, for taking the time um, to, to chat with us and share your story. Um, appreciate you. Um, very Aww. cool for like uh, for the information and stories that you told and shared. Yeah, I appreciate you inviting me onto your platform and just for reaching out. I I saw so many of your videos and just so much of your content like over time, and I think you're doing a good job. So I hope you continue to like inspire people, um, interview people, bring them onto your podcast, and just continue open conversations because I think that's important. So. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay. Well, goodbye for now. All right. Wishing you much success and prosperity and blessings. Peace. Thank you.